I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. A new book, Japan, 1941. Countdown to Infamy. Ari Hote is the author. A gifted, articulate, and at this point, completely new telling of the Second World War in the Pacific. Ari Hote is a scholar who has dealt with Japanese diplomatic history, the events behind the scenes, behind the scenes, that made decisions to attack the United States December 7, 1941. These are compelling, charismatic human beings, the men in Japan who came to this decision to attack the United States. They're outsized individuals in most instances, and Aries is a wonderful guide because she has both languages, all these languages, and can see not only from their point of view inside the Japanese, but many of them were bi and trilingual and can see from their English speaking side and their German speaking side. Ari, congratulations and good evening. We begin with a very Japanese hero, Lieutenant Commander Genda Minoru, who is beckoned by Rear Admiral Onishi Takajiro. The date is early February 1941. The,、uh, Agenda serves on Kaga, one of the Kirobotai, the flying squadron, the supercarriers that attack Pearl Harbor. But at this time, he's an officer in the aerial division of the Japanese Navy, the Imperial Japanese Navy. Onishi calls him, and Genda doesn't know why. He sits down. What does Onishi tell him?、Um, Onishi tells him that he has this letter from Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, who is Um, known to the Western world as the mastermind behind Pearl Harbor operation. This was the first time he, Yamamoto, talks to anybody about his uh, uh, emerging plans, and he solicits Onishi and、um, Genda's help in conceiving of this fantastic、uh, and fantastical gambler, gambler's plan. Uh, uh, Genda responds, What? And then is told by Yamamoto, you can do it. Don't tell me about torpedoes. You can do it. We'll find a way. It's February 1941. Eri's story is about diplomatic history, and we need to involve all the levels of, scene,、uh, of command in the Navy and the Army and then to the government. At this, at this time, the government is changing back and forth between one prime minister and another, but the important prime minister is a prince of Japan, Kono A. The Emperor Hirohito is also involved, but we're going to start this story with Yamamoto because he's a charismatic figure. Five feet three, attends Harvard 1919 to 1921, is stationed in Washington 26 to 28. He's born in the North, and that's an important part of his personality in addition to being a gambler. What does it mean, Ari, from the North in Japan? To be from the North at that point meant that you are from the losing side of the Civil War. Uh, that happened in the second half of the 19th century in Japan,、uh, right after Japan opened its door to Western trade. And it meant that、uh, one is sort of uh, uh, branded a rebel to the cause of the imperial government. So one had to work extra hard to prove oneself in the new government that took over the shogunate. Uh, Yamamoto is a romantic character to read about. At one point, you're told that he's kicked out of the casinos in Monte Carlo because he's such a good gambler. He likes poker, he likes bridge. Was he at,、uh, at peace with himself as a warrior at, in these years? You say he's driven. He marries at 34, he has children at 40. Did he give off the sense that he was calm or was he frantic like Matsuko? Well, I think it's hard to tell. I think on the surface he had this、uh, calm of a, a very good gambler who wouldn't really, you know, poker faced gambler who would not really reveal any emotions. But he also liked to womanize and drink and all that. I think he wanted to live, the, live his life to the fullest so that he would be ready to die at any moment and take that you know, gambler's risk. The warrior cult, it drives a lot of the decisions here because in the shogunate, of course, there was the understanding that the wandering warriors、uh, attached themselves to their masters. We're talking about Yamamoto, and we'll get to the emperor, but there's another warrior from the north who's important here in making the decisions to go to war. We call him Tojo. He's from the north. What do we need to know about his personality? I think his personality was the sort of polar opposite. 
of Yamamoto's. He didn't really live his life to the fullest in the sense that he was uh, uh, very self-disciplined, if boring, a uh, soldier who really uh, wanted to serve the imperial state and wanted to be a good soldier. He was a very able, good bureaucrat, good student in terms of academic records uh, when he was attending elite uh, military academy. But I don't think he was as much fun as Yamamoto was. He's the one who authored the phrase, you say it was on a, a recording, you could hear that it's uh, wrong to survive a battle, that you must sacrifice yourself for the emperor. That was issued in January 1941, uh, when he was still an army minister of the government. And I think that sort of death cult had a very indoctrinating effect on the whole of the nation. It's not just the soldiers who are being told that you're not you know, supposed to be taken, you know, captured alive. You, you, and that's very shameful for any Japanese to suffer that fate. So you'd rather, you know, kill yourself when you're faced with uh, impending enemies. That and that's be what happens. That becomes one of the fascinations of the Second War from the American point of view, the self-destruction of the armies that are fighting so hard on the islands and then the self-destruction of Japanese civilians who believe that they'd have no fate yes. after capture. Let's go to the larger story you've already mentioned about the shogunate because... Uh, Tojo and Yamamoto serve the emperor, but I learned from you that the emperor is newly built. They've fashioned it. This is the Meiji Restoration that happens in the middle of the 19th century that's a resolution of two warring shogunates, the Choshu and the Tokugawa. The Choshu, what do we need to know about that serving that shogunate? Well, um, I think it's a slightly more complicated story that the imperial system had always been there more than 2,000 years uh, or so it was claimed but uh, the imperial system was used to legitimize certain people in power be it sort of samurai warriors or the shogunates who came to uh, unify Japan at certain points in time of Japanese history uh, when Japan was forced opened by the American black ships uh, um, and sort of the threat of uh, colonization, some people realize that Japan has to just, uh, you know, get its act together and modernize, which meant uh, militarizing and industrializing very quickly along the Western models. And the uh, Choshu Satsuma people were into modernization and sort of you know, receiving credibility from the emperor and restoring the imperial institution, making a cult, much stronger cult around it, they legitimized their newly attained rule after defeating the shogunate in Tokyo, the Tokugawa shogunate. The first emperor, the emperor that's important here, is empowered not only by with the Meiji Restoration, but also by a relationship with the military. That's what's important here, that the military has a strong hand, is not got, lorded over by civilian rule, has a relationship with the emperor that will become profound and also make decision-making extremely difficult. The first, em uh, the first emperor... The first modern emperor. The first modern <laughs> emperor, yes, thank you, goes through a period uh, where the soldiers pledge allegiance to him. It's called the imperial rescript to soldiers and sailors. That would be in the memory or uh, the childhood of all of the senior officers in the Second War. What was that, Ari? That was uh, basically an outline of military conduct that values um, life as, you know, much less insignificant, much less significant than the loyalty to the emperor, basically. So it sort of instills this sense of absolute obedience to the cause of imperial Japan and that you know, individualism doesn't really quite come into play in that. And it, this was really the case not, for, not only for the professional soldiers, but people who get drafted into the system, people who get recruited to fight, uh, you know, certain wars. Uh, there was one with the Qin China and then with the Imperial Russia around the turn of the century. So I think it was much more widespread idea than people realize. The Emperor Mutsuhito, is that mm -hmm. how you say it? Mutsuhito, yes. he has a son, Yoshihito, who is not healthy. 
not healthy, and he suffered from mental illnesses and also physical weaknesses, and he was not really fit for the throne. And his son, Hirohito, uh, takes over his rule as a regent. Yes, and before he takes over, because Yoshihito understands that he needs to groom his son quickly because his health is so fragile, he sends Hirohito on a world tour, a grand tour. There's a photograph in your book of Hirohito standing next to David Lloyd George. This is after the First War. Mm -hmm. And there's a moving scene you point to when Hirohito visits the battlefield in Belgium. What does he learn on the battlefield? That uh, the guide, the Belgian officer who was showing him around, had lost his son on that very battlefield, and the officer starts to cry, and Hirohito's eyes also well up. And it, it's sort of uh, it, this is an anecdotal thing that that gets told, you know, which is a sign, which is considered to be a sign of his sort of ingrained pacifism. Hirohito will become emperor in the 1920s. Uh, my date here says that Yoshihito died at the age of 47 in 1926, and Hirohito becomes Japan's emperor. This is the emperor who blesses, who sits, who watches the gathering storm for the Second War. So we'll watch Hirohito and his relationship to that warrior cult that we talk about with Tojo in the army and Yamamoto in the Navy. The book is Japan 1941, Countdown to Infamy. Ari Hota is the author. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Ari Hota's book, Japan 1941, is rich and tragic and fascinating, and I can get obsessed about these details. I have read a great deal of Pacific War history over these last 13, 14 years in this work, and never have I seen behind the scenes the gathering storm from the Japanese imperial point of view. This is nowhere near as monolithic and fixed and dictatorial and heretical as I've been led to believe. Similar, I've been told that it was like the Hitlerites, nothing whatsoever. It has to do with ambition and yearning and envy. And also Japan was intimately related to the United States. It was sympathetic. It was fascinated. It was often sending its sons and daughters to educate in the United States and come back and introduce ideas. So Hirohito is one of those men who travels widely before he becomes emperor. But the emperor cult, we need to understand that. Ari, the emperor cult was shaped in the military, because that's what we're f uh, f focusing on, by the imperial way faction and the control faction. What were the differences? Well, Imperial Way faction is uh, a faction of the the army, especially that came into prominence in the 1920s, and uh, especially after the Depression, actually, in the 1930s, when uh, Japan's future seemed uh, uncertain, that uh, you have Bolshevism lurking from the north uh, in the form of Soviet Union, and you don't really trust China because it seems too disintegrated and weak. So what do we do as the vanguard of Asian leadership and as the sort of superior Asian nation, what should we do with the, the sort of obsession with this imperial way faction? But the idea that um, some, something drastic had to be done is at the forefront of their ideology. And something drastic also had to be done at home too, which meant that even sort of um, replacing the emperor, if need be, with the younger brother who seemed more um, army-oriented and was more soldier-like and more macho, um, whereas control faction was more into professionalization of the military class, that uh, you needed efficiency and um, national mobilization state that could uh, withstand any uh, threat from the outside. So even though their methods were different, they were really thinking Japan in terms of a nation led by the military. 
the army and the navy i don't see there's any generality to say the army was imperial wave faction the navy was control faction bureaucrats seem control faction as well it seems like everyone was aware that there was this mix going on and then we had repeated assassinations or attempted assassinations by so-called right wingers what is the right wing represent with regard to the uh, the military well, the right-wing factions, they sometimes belong to the military and sometimes not. Um, but uh, sort of they had this fascistic ideas that the military should take over the Japanese state. And they tended to come from uh, very radicalized and ideologized uh, professional um, officer class who could tap into the discontent of younger soldiers who often came from the very poor countryside which were really you know, um, hard hit by the depress Great Depression and natural disasters. So, it, I mean, even that is very nuanced, that who used who and for what purpose. But they were often, the radicals were often excused, even, you know, looked upon sympathetically even if they get uh, executed after they get captured, that uh, they were thinking in terms of, uh, the you know goodness of Japanese imperial system that you know they were there to help the emperor that they should be looked upon with uh, some kind of mercy and understanding so that's a very weird kind of patriotic rendering of rebels we need to take of the civilian government because that's how the two military well, uh, divisions, the army and the navy, and these factions within them will play off against each other, always in the presence of the superiority of the emperor and then the superiority of the prime minister and the foreign minister. So Prince Konae, I, we can introduce him here and then to get to the critical foreign minister Matsuko. Prince Konae, he comes from Hirohito's class, right? And he would have been regarded as revered, as, almost as revered as the emperor. Yes, almost. Well, I think if not more, in some ways, because he came from this uh, very noble family, the second noblest uh, next to the imperial family, which really went back to the 7th century Japan. Um, and, you know, he was intimately related to the, the emperor um, in several ways. So I think he was, it, it's safe to say that he was on the, so, the same social footing as the emperor. And if anybody could talk to Hirohito straightforwardly and frankly, that would have been him. Uh, uh, Konae becomes Prime Minister in 1937. The 1930s are ripped with uh, major incidents. There's the China incident, and of course there's the, the, the story in Shanghai and Nanjing in 1937 as well. But Prince Konae will focus on this because in the run-up to war, the decision to attack the Americans, Konae has the power to stop it and does not. The book is Japan, 1941. Ari Hota is the author. When we come back, a figure that is out of make-believe. His name is Matsuko. He's the important foreign minister meeting with the Germans and the Russians simultaneously in 1941. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Ari Hota has done us the great, good work of taking Japanese diplomatic history with all of the language that's so hard to translate into a, in the English language and then into the American English language to understand the shades of the personalities that drove the Japanese Empire in 1937 to crash against the American Empire in 1941 leading to, four years later, Holocaust in Japan, the two atomic bombs after the firebombing of all the major cities, and an end of the Japanese Empire, and many lives and families crushed by this. All right, Matsuko, he's a fascination to me because he's a, he's a man on the make. 
What makes Sammy Rum? We recognize this on Broadway. We love it in American television. A kid with a with a shoe shine and a smile, an ambition that's outsized, driving, demanding. He's vain. He's arrogant. He is self-educated. He spends the formative years, I think, between uh, when he was a teenager in the United States. He graduates from the University of Oregon in law school. He is so completely American. Did the Japanese people around him, did they look at him as a stranger? Yes, absolutely. And that's why they couldn't really say anything to him when uh, Matsuoka said to them, oh, I know so much more about America and the outside world than any of you. And they had to shut up. But in some ways, Matsuoka's experience in the West Coast of America was rather um, uneven. Had he gone to more privileged sort of East Coast institutions and Ivy League schools and didn't have this uh, chip on his shoulder about um, um, having to struggle for everything, that he he was indeed a self-made man, he was very poor, but very proud. I think um, the outcome of Japanese diplomacy in 1940-41 would have been very different. Kona A has a relationship with Matsoko, and it's a, it's a mystery to me, because Kona A has nothing to apologize for. He's privileged, as we say. He's a prince of the land. His family is probably several million years old. I don't know, but in <laughs> any event, it certainly predates Matsoko's uh, family. What was their relationship? Can we guess? Yes, I think we can safely guess that at the time of the signing of the Tripartite Pact in the fall of 1940, 1940 um, they were, were very much honeymooning. They needed each other. Um, Konoe needed uh, Matsuoka's ability to get things done and even defy the military if needed to be. And um, Matsuoka needed uh, the authenticity and sort of legitimacy of uh, a true... Uh, blue-blooded leader like uh, Konoe. And so, Konoe, could he get Matsuko to obey him, or was Matsuko always pushing Konoe aside? Konoe, I, f- I picture him sitting there silent, not angry, passive, and I picture Matsuko uh, using that passive silence as a power weapon, you know, to, the Prime Minister's not going to stop me, so do what I want. I think it became a sort of a, a, a invitation for abuse in the spring of 1941 when they had personal fallings out and Konoe very much wanted to get the diplomatic uh, plan, uh, the sort of change the diplomacy into more pro-American one when Matsuoka was still insisting that, oh, it, it's better to play hardball because Americans would respect us more if we really you know, stuck by the Triple Alliance and had more uh, negotiational leverage. So that's when Matsuoka started abusing his silence, Konoe's silence. Konoe um, didn't do anything. He was sort of doing things behind his back to make sure that he didn't have to handy his own hands, but to be able to oust Matsuoka, which took too long. I think Konoe could have used his power more effectively had he confronted Matsuoka more directly. Matsuoka Yasuki, you, you, you titled the chapter of where we introduced to his character the return of Don Quixote. Is that you, or is that an opinion in Japan now, that this is our Don? Oh, uh, I, think the, I think people are at a loss as to how to interpret Matsuoka. I think he's... Uh, in some sense, reviled for uh, you know signing Japan up for the tripartite pact. On the other hand, Japan has really not seen any effective diplomacy um, in defiance of Western diplomacy carried out since then. So I think its emotion is quite mixed. And yes, often he is sort of singled out as one of the major reasons for the war. But then. It, there, there were people who could have stopped him. He was not a you know, uh, prime minister or the emperor. No, he's sitting there pounding the table in 1941 <laughs> saying, tax Stalin, attack Stalin. All right, the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy is signed September 27th, uh, 1940. Uh, that requires no real explanation uh, beyond this. In the Japanese translation of Mein Kampf, they cut out the parts where Hitler defamed Japanese, Correct. Correct. <laughs> And that was what Japan wanted to, what the the ruling party wanted to make of Hitler, expedience. 
How expedient? What did they want from Germany and Italy? They're so far away. They don't have anything to do with what Japan is looking for, which is Asia for Asians. Why Germany? I think Germany, it's, it's hard to imagine for us because we know what happened afterwards. But, and also we know the sort of content of a, a very dangerous ideological orientation of the Nazi party. But I think for many people in Japan, they didn't quite understand the danger of Nazism at all. And they just saw this disciplined, regimental um, sort of systematic efficiency in Nazism, which was really, you know, their view really underestimated the, the danger. And do you believe that it was because they weren't interested? It was expedient? I mean, I understand we're generalizing a lot, but mm -hmm. Matsuko. So was it, a, was it a personal vanity on his part? This mm -hmm. dictator knows who I am. I think there was a lot of personal vanity factor in it. On the other hand, uh, Matsuoka was also a, a believer in the power of power politics, mm. that uh, each nation has to have a, a leverage in alliance power so that you know, one could negotiate effectively. He idolized uh, Metternich because he could play one power of another, and um, that's what he wanted to be, a great statesman who could yeah. sort of you know, play his card uh, most effectively. Matsuko is a, is, a, is, a, is a man for all seasons in hell, Larry. That's what I'm <laughs> learning because we're about to take him to Moscow. He has a personal relationship with Stalin. Stalin comes down to the train station to greet him. Yes. And, and Stalin is there and Molotov is there and he finds the neutra signs the neutrality ta pact with Russia. He's now signed on, he signed Japan on to two trains bound for Hades. That's what he's done. Yes. And I think that's, according to his own explanation, that should scare the United States into negotiating with Japan so that uh, he could reach a diplomatic solution with the United States without firing a single shot. So that was how warped his understanding was. But um, to him, it made sense in terms of power, um, the balance of power approach. And Matsuko is a known quantity in Washington will make note of that, that Hull is the Secretary of State and FDR is his own Secretary of State, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, now into his third term as presidency, watching the war in Europe with great despair and also restrained from joining in his, his colleague and friend and co-equal Churchill suffering with the attacks and the successes of Hitler. Remember all this time that Matt Soko is... Uh, signing these pacts with Germany and Russia. Germany and Russia have entered into a non-aggression pact that won't be broken until June of 1941. So Matsuko is there before Barbarossa, before the breakdown. We need to leap here because Ari's done so much, so much careful craft. We're going to leave things out, and I beg pardon, Ari, but we need to go to the conference late June uh, to July 2nd, the Imperial Conference at the Meiji, Meiji Palace. Who was there? What was their challenge? Well, all the key ministers and the general staff uh, officers, the chiefs and vice chiefs of staff were there, and they were deciding then to, rather than to discuss what to do with the post-German uh, uh, attack in the Soviet Union uh, situation, they are quickly sort of opting for um, the, this policy of all-around preparedness in, in the South. When... Europe is sort of um, embroiled in turmoil of this war, Hitler's war. They decide that colonial Southeast Asia is left unguarded. And if they peacefully take over the southern part of uh, Indochina, Indochinese Peninsula, present-day Vietnam, um, they would gain a, a very effective foothold in Southeast Asia. Of course, some planners were thinking in terms of war in the in, Southeast Asia or, you know, reaching even further towards uh, the Indonesian oil fields, but that's not what they are saying. The leaders are just saying that it's a peaceful move, and they would just sort of make sure that everything is being grabbed when nobody's looking. Oh, so the debate here is north versus south. 
Uh, the South means Indochina, what eventually becomes the occupation of Indochina, and then we know in the war, the push on Singapore, Indo Indonesia, Dutch, East Indies, there's expedience there, there's oil and tin and rubber, but most of the point is that the army doesn't have enough to go north and south together. They've been, in, they've been tied down in the Chinese war for eight years now, seven years now, and it's exhausting the army's resources. The navy, however, is fresh to the fight. So the debate at this conference between June 24th and July 2nd, my note here, Ari, Ari correct me, mm -hmm. is north versus south. Matsuko, however, wants to go north. He wants to attack Russia. Why? Uh, because he wanted to impress uh, Hitler. He regarded the Nazi alliance Japan's Nazi alliance is more important than this neutral, neutrality pact that he had just signed with uh, Stalin. Um, he thinks that it's an easy sort of re um, you know, gesture to make. They don't really have to attack the Soviet Union um, in Moscow. They just attack them in the north and just grab whatever they can grab in the north and um, impress its ally, Germany and say, oh, you know, we've fought for you. Matsuko, the, uh, what at this point you'd have to say, he is the devil's best friend. He is looking to advance his own cause. He wants to be prime minister. He wants to rise to the top. He wants to be at the emperor's level. But he has an idea that if the imperial conference had followed it, Stalin can't transfer the Siberian division. Moscow falls. Hitler wins in the war on Russia, or at least to the point that Stalin is torn from power. Japan is secured in the West. There's no attack on on, the, on Pearl Harbor. The world changes, Ari. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed. I think, although Matsuka was too optimistic about the German invincibility, of course we know that now, um, I think he was very optimistic and thought that you know, what they had to do in the North vis-à-vis -vis the Soviet Union was a very sort of symbolic gesture, like Italy joining in right. Um, Germany right before the fall of Paris, um, when it was almost secure that uh, France will fall. Um, so it was slightly a miscalculation on his part, but the bigger miscalculation, which Matsuka was the only one, ironically, to be aware of, was that by going south, by Deciding to occupy the southern parts of uh, French Indochina, Japan will alarm the United States and Britain, whose um, Southeast Asian interests were very close by, and that wouldn't go unchecked. Matsuka was right about that, but nobody else really listened to him because by then Matsuka had become a um, sort of a unwanted personality. Kono uh, very much wanted him to be out. He just hadn't taken the trouble of ousting him yet. The decisions are made by July 2nd that this can be done and we go south and we'll take the risk of, a, of Britain and the United States going to war with us. That's where they leave it. They're on the road to ruin. However, there are moments here that we must deal with in Washington. Nomura is the ambassador in Washington and a man named Kurosu, who was president at the signing of the tripartite pact, has excellent English. It's... I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Ari Hota's book, Japan 41, is 1941, is rich, rich, rich. And I've done a very, very over-the-surface job because I'm so fascinated with Matsuko. And because these moments, you, you want to reach in there and say, don't you realize what's going to happen? But of course they don't because this is done. And what's fresh to me is how fragile the Japanese governance was as they made these decisions. Uh, 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 Ari makes it very clear that the actual planning for the attack on Pearl Harbor was done by juniors, bureaucrats almost, within the Army and the Navy, chiefly the Navy. And once the ministers are present at these planning uh, re uh, results, these papers laid out, the ministers are sometimes compelled to say, I don't know as much as he does, I guess we'll go along with the plan. So it's not consensus. It's passivity in the face of a plan that emerges from ambitious junior officers. Let's now go to seniors in Washington because there is a misreading of the Japanese by Hull and FDR in my, in my interpretation of this book. Ari, Nomura doesn't have good English. Kur Kurosu does. And they're dealing with Hull these last weeks. They're given a deadline. Get this done by November 21st, says Tojo, says Togo, the, the foreign minister. 
And what we have here is Hull misunderstanding what Nomura and Kurosu are trying to do. We also have meetings with FDR. Your opinion now, that November, was that all pretense or would a successful negotiation in Washington sometime in the middle of the month, would it have stopped the gears of the Kito Butai? That's a very difficult question. I think the Japanese, the Tokyo leaders would like to claim that had the United States acted differently, they would have stop the momentum for war, but I very much doubt it because they didn't really have the courage to stop it before, before it had ex- escalated to that point. As far as the intention of the two diplomats that you mentioned, Kurusu and Nomura, were concerned, I think they were quite genuine. They were unaware of the precise deadline that was set in Tokyo, and it was you know they kept Tokyo kept telling them that oh it's extended by a day or two you know make an sort of last minute extra efforts to to reach an agreement with Washington when the Imperial Conference had in fact already decided for war. So they were deliberately made into a sort of sacrificial lamb who really didn't know what was going on. They arrive at the State Department uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, after Hull knows about the attack on Pearl Harbor. He reads the document, the 14-page document that has been arduously typed out by the two men, Nomura and Kurosu, and a, a typist they find suddenly. It's too arbitrary to say that this is, is a conspiracy, but I learned from Ari that these are critical moments, that because the document arrived that the, where at the end of negotiations, well, war is imminent, after the attack, Mr. Roosevelt was able to use that on December 8th before Congress, and that was a blow to the Japanese. I see that that still is a, a source of controversy in Japan, 72 years later. Yes. Um, I think, well, um, I might have not stressed this point clearly, but I th- don't think any well if the diplomats delivered the documents in time uh, would Roosevelt have acted differently I'm not so sure because he Roosevelt himself makes clear that the, it's the stealth and um, cowardly nature of the attack itself that was so abominable to the Americans and you know his people that you know, it, it was not really spelled out that Japan was going to attack in those documents anyway, that it was not going to make any difference. Illegality from the point of view of uh, international law, depending on what kind of interpretation you take, Japan was taking a very illegal action, even, had, even if they had uh, delivered the documents in time. So I'm not so sure whether um, that would have made a dramatic difference. It's regrettable that um, it didn't get delivered in time. I think the argument would have been weaker, for sure. I learned from you, Ari, also, we just have a minute, that the emperor had the information that Roosevelt was sending him a message just a half an hour before the attack, Mm -hmm. and he couldn't have stopped it either, could he? He, Well, I think if anybody could have... uh, not, well, not at that last stage, not, right. not even the emperor could have, no. So what we're having here is everyone standing by frozen watching this catastrophe collapse on December 7th. Mm-hmm. They're in place. And is that place, just my last question to you, Ari, because your book is so rich and people are going to get a chance to come to their own conclusions, mm-hmm. was everything in place after July 2nd? Was that the last moment? Um, no, I think it was still reversible. I think un- until the end of November it was reversible, precisely because the emperor could have vetoed the war decision, which came into being at the beginning of December. Uh, Ari Hota's book, Japan 1941, Countdown to Infamy, I recommend it to everyone who has read the, the Pacific War from the American point of view to enter into this discussion. And Matsuko, 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 what a character. I'm John Batchelor.